the question I want to ask today. And it's a question that when I ask it, you might chuckle inside. You might think there's, there's no way that this is possible. But we're going to look at this question today. It's this. Is it possible to disagree with a person politically while still loving them completely? Let me ask this again. Is it possible for us as followers of Jesus to disagree with a person politically while still loving them completely? Let me ask it a different way. Is it possible to not agree with someone 100% and yet still love them 100%? I think it is possible, but I don't think it'll be easy. How about you? Not in the world we live in. The world we live in doesn't quite embrace nuance. In a political culture where disengagement equals defection, we've made nuance an enemy to the point where it seems like there is no middle ground. You're either on this side or you're on that side. And if you're on this side, then those on that side are our enemies. And if you're on that side, then those on this side are our enemies. And that is sort of the world we live in. But I don't know about you, I don't think that world is creating a better future. I think we can do better. I think we must do better. I think we must rise above it and it will not be easy, but I think it begins with us asking the question, is it possible to disagree with someone politically and yet still love them completely? That's the question we're gonna wrestle with today. And I wanna start answering this question by looking at something that the apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter nine. And I'm fairly positive that if, If Paul said this today, if Paul, like we'll read this and go, oh, that sounds so great. But if Paul said this today in the political climate we live in, I am convinced Paul would have been canceled by everyone on the left and he would have been canceled by everyone on the right as well. Everyone would have canceled him because of what Paul had to say in 1 Corinthians chapter nine. It was that revolutionary then and it would be this revolutionary now. Here's what Paul says to a group of new believers in the empire of Rome, in 1 Corinthians chapter nine. If you have your Bible, you can open up there. If not, we'll have the words on the screen. Paul says this. He says, though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. Now, some of you might already be thinking to yourself uh, what the Christians in Rome were probably thinking to themselves. And they heard Paul say, I'm a slave to everyone. And they're like, wait, 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 wait. You're a slave to everyone? Like, Paul, what's the fine print here? Because you you cannot possibly mean everyone when you say everyone. You probably mean this side or that side or this group of people or that group of people, but it sure sounds like you're saying that that I'm going to make myself a slave to everyone. You can imagine the first audience hearing Paul thinking maybe what some of you are thinking. I should make myself a slave to those even that I disagree with? Even those that think and live differently than I do? Am I supposed to be a slave even to those people on the other side of the political aisle, Paul? Like, come on, Paul, that's crazy. But if that part bothers you, just wait to what he says next because Paul's just getting warmed up. Paul says this, to the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. Those not, to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free of God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that all possible means I might save some. And I do this all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings." So you can imagine Paul as he's saying like, hey, to the the Jews, I become like Jews. To the Gentiles, I become like the Gentiles. To the weak, I become like the weak. To those under the law, I become like that under the law. To those not under the law, I become like those not under the law. And I do all of this. I imagine Paul seeing the tension in the room. So that's why he ends with telling why he's doing what he's doing. And what is his reasoning for why he does what he does? It's Jesus. He's like, the reason I become all things to all people is for the sake of the gospel. In other words, for the sake of the message that Jesus came here to tell. And just in case you, that, that what I just read didn't sink in or wasn't quite, it didn't ruffle any feathers for you. Let me just read it today, how it might be translated. Here's what Paul would have said. To the Republicans, I became like a Republican to win the Republicans. To those who are Democrats, I became like the Democrats so as to win the Democrats. 
To those who are independents, I became like those uh, independents as so as to win the independents. To the progressives, I became progressive. To the conservatives, I became conservative. Why? So that by all possible means, I might save some. Why do I do this? Because this is what Jesus would have me do. Some of y'all are sitting here like, I'm ready to cancel that dude right now. What's Paul talking about? This is so contrary to the world and culture and political climate that we live in. I mean, some of you are maybe hearing what Paul says here, and you're like, Paul, have a backbone, man. Paul, stand for something. What a coward. What a poser. What a fraud. Paul, that's not how the world works. You can't choose both sides. You can't have it both ways. You can't become all things to all people. You are either on this side, Paul, or you're on that side, Paul. That's just how the world works. Let's be real. Some of us are thinking that, right? Like, like Paul, if Paul writes this in a church today, there's no doubt in my mind that Paul's getting a few angry emails. And if all this bothers you, then you're really going to hate why Paul did it. Like if everything that Paul said bothers you and feels, ugh, creates some dissonance in you, then you're going to hate why Paul did it. The reason Paul didn't take a side is because Paul was convinced that Jesus didn't take a side either. Paul was convinced that the story and mission and uh, gospel of Jesus was bigger than this side and it was bigger than that side. It was bigger than a party, a platform, or a policy. It was for the entire world because Jesus didn't come to take sides. He came to take over. Jesus didn't come to save this group of people. He came to save every group of people. And so Paul's like, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't choose a corner. Instead, I'm going to every corner. I'm going to every person. I'm standing with every person. In a world that would rather stand on issues, Paul says, I'm going to do what Jesus did and I'm going to walk with people. And I wonder what it would look like if we did the same. What would this look like in 2024? Is it possible even? Is it possible to disagree with someone politically and yet still walk with them and show up and love them completely? And that brings me to the pre-decision I want to invite us to make before the election picks up steam. Every week, I'm inviting you to make a decision. And it's up to you whether you make it. But I'm convinced that if we made these decisions together, we'll tell a better story than we told in 2020. And who here wants to tell a better story than 2020? Who here wants to end this year not tired, not angry, not bitter, not jaded, not cynical? I do. And so I think if we step into these, these invitations, we'll have the chance to rise above the noise and tell a better story. And I think Christians should tell the best story of all. Can I get an amen on that? And so how do we do this? Here's the decision today. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy at all. Here's the decision I want to invite you to make. Thou shalt choose you over a view. Thou shalt choose you. And by you, I don't mean you. I mean the yous around you. Thou shalt choose you over a view. I will choose people over party. I will choose people over platforms. I will choose to walk with people more than simply stand on issues. Why? Because I will choose you over a view. Now, let me be clear. I'm not suggesting that you do not hold a view. I'm not suggesting that you do not have an opinion. I'm not saying that you don't even have opinion with conviction. What I am suggesting is that we decide today that our views will not take precedence over all the yous that you will encounter in your life. I'm suggesting that you don't allow a view that you hold to stop you from loving all the yous in your workplace, the yous in your family, even all the crazy yous in your family, the yous in your church, the yous on your social media feeds. What I'm inviting you into is something that would truly be noticeable, notable, and distinct if we actually did it. And that is that I, we decide today, I will choose you over view. Let me be clear again. I'm not suggesting that we love our country less, but I'm suggesting something crazy. We love people more. I'm suggesting not that we don't love America. I'm just suggesting that we love our fellow Americans, that we love our neighbors, that we love every person, American or not, that we love people because Jesus's mission, his priority was and is and will always be people. Because when I die, I will not go to Washington, D.C. And neither will you. 
your soul will not be transported to the White House. And I will not stand before Abraham Lincoln and and George Washington and give them both an account for my life. When I die, I will stand before Jesus. And when I stand before Jesus, what I want to hear more than anything else is I want to hear Jesus say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You cared about what I cared about, and what I care about is people. Well done, my good and faithful servant. One of the greatest fears I have in my life is I'll stand before my Lord, before my Savior, and Jesus will say, you were successful at everything that didn't really matter to me. You gained the world and you lost your soul in the process. See, I don't want to have that conversation. I doubt you do too. So how do we do that? How do we show up with the same love and kindness that Jesus showed up with? And I believe we can do this by making a decision today, a hard decision, a daily decision. Sometimes it'll be a moment to moment, case by case, uh, to choose a you over a view. I'm going to choose you over a view. Next time your family member says something dumb, you're just going to walk away and be like, I'm going to choose you over a view right now. I'm going to choose you over a view right now. And it will cost you. It's not complicated, but it will cost you, right? This view will cost you. It will cost you comfort. It will cost you your ego. Sometimes it will even cost you not winning that debate that you really want to win. It will cost you. It won't be easy. It costs Paul. It costs Jesus. It costs every one of the disciples to rise above the noise of the world. And it will cost us to do the same as well. What does it look like for us to choose you over a view? Pastor Eugene Cho, he uh, actually wrote a book that this series was inspired from called Thou Shall Not Be a Jerk. And here's what Pastor Eugene Cho said. He said this, to be a Christ follower is to be faithful amid tension, to stay engaged, to remain hopeful, to love anyway, to walk with integrity and to bear witness to the love, mercy and grace of Christ. This is becoming increasingly difficult. And everybody said, amen. But such is our call as followers of Jesus. It's not merely what we believe, but it's also how we engage, right? Like we talked about this in week one, that Christians were not known for what they believed. They were known for how they lived. And today, unfortunately, it seems that more Christians are known for what they believe instead of how they live. And we're being invited back into the original way the way of the early church that rose above the noise, a hard way, a costly way, sometimes an inconvenient, uncomfortable way, but the way that Jesus invites us into nonetheless, the way of love. Now, I love how Eugene Peterson, his translation of the same words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter nine, the words that we read earlier that maybe made you a little angry. Uh, Eugene Peterson translated that, uh, that, those verses in a little bit more modern language. And I wanna read it to you today because I think it, it adds a nice little kind of perspective. He says this, Even though I'm free of the demands and expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people, religious, non-religious, meticulous moralists, loose living immoralists, the defeated, the demoralized, whoever. I didn't take on their way of life. Let me be clear. Paul's not saying, hey, I didn't like take on their way of life. He says, I kept my bearings in Christ but I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. I've become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. And I did all of this because of the message, the message of Jesus. I didn't just want to talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. And if you're here and, and you're like Paul today, maybe you're like, yeah, I want to be in on it too. If everything I'm saying about rising above the noise and being noticeable, notable, and distinct is something that that resonates with you, you're like, yeah, the way way we're doing things isn't working. There's got to be a better way, and I want in on that. And you want to be a part of a bigger story. That's who I want to talk to for the rest of the day. And if you're here and you're like, no, man, I'd rather choose views over use. I'm quite content with my party platform and my posture and position. I'm I'm just going to kind of give it another go and see if it works this time. That's fine. That's entirely up to you. But if you're here and you're like, no, I want to practice the way of Jesus, even though it's a harder way, then I want you to lean in for a moment. How do we choose a you over your views? But first, let me share what I think stops most people, including myself, from choosing a you over a view. It's called the fundamental attribution error. Has anyone ever heard of fundamental attribution error? 
Well, nice, Kurt, my man. All right, that's cool. One person, two people. All right, so most people have not actually heard this in this room. That's awesome. Um, I promise, though, all of us in this room, although you've never heard of it, like myself, you've done it. The fundamental attribution error describes our tendency to attribute people's behavior to their character while attributing our behavior to our circumstances. So everyone else's behavior, it's a character issue. But for me and my behavior, totally circumstantial. It's the fundamental attribution error. So what this looks like, when your coworker, who you don't really like, is late to another shift at work or another meeting, you assume he's so disorganized. He just doesn't care. He's so lazy. He's not invested in the team like I'm invested in the team. After all, how hard is it to be on time? But when you're late, ah, oh man, it's not character. It's totally circumstantial. Traffic was terrible. Oh man, I'm just really tired. I overslept. I, I had a crisis at home. You may go as far as to assume your reputation as a responsible employee is so airtight that you don't even need to explain your late arrival. Like you should all know that I'm bought in because there's so much evidence. Your associates will assume the result of your circumstances was beyond your control. Fundamental attribution error happens when we say someone else's actions reflect the kind of person they are rather than the circumstances of their lives. And it's easy to see how this affects us at home at work, but it affects us politically as well. Fundamental attribution error will cause us to say things like this. Oh, those corrupt Democrats or those mindless Republicans. Or clearly there's something wrong with all these people. How could they say that? How could they stand on that policy? How could they vote for that candidate? What is wrong with them? Fundamental attribution error will conclude that obviously What's wrong with all of them is they all just have character issues. And they're all just bad people. Democrats are godless socialists and Republicans are greedy capitalists. While ignoring the possibility that the view of those on the other side don't have anything to do with how they grew up, where they grew up, who they grew up around, or what experiences they've had along the way. It couldn't be that they are responding to circumstances and experiences no, fundamental attribution error simply concludes, no, them on the other side, they just have a character problem. This is why I think one of the best questions you can ask when you're in a room with someone that you disagree with, maybe someone who sits on the other side of the aisle and they share a view or a conviction that's like fundamentally opposed to yours, instead of your first response being, nah, you're dumb, like, now, uh, you're wrong, and here's why you're wrong, and you have a PowerPoint presentation to prove why they're wrong. Before you do that, here's a really good question. Tell me how you got there. How'd you get there? Right, because that question acknowledges that every person is more than a view. That every person is a collection of stories and experiences and influences and upbringings. And if you really want to understand where they got where they are, it's better to lean in and Assume that, hey, there's probably something or many things circumstantially that got them to where they are today. Instead of, you voted for that person? You're a terrible human being. You obviously don't love people. I mean, let's be honest, how productive is that? Has, that, has, has anyone heard that or done that and be like, and then we became best friends? <laughs> like, like that, that's not how it ever begins. And yet for many of us, that's how we're beginning so much. Fundamental attribution error, it's everywhere. The news, Twitter, or X, or whatever you want to call it. Facebook, your inbox. In fact, Pew Research Center reported in 2019 that 55% of Republicans and 47% of Democrats view members of the other party as more immoral than the average American. Like solely based on who they voted for, you are more immoral than everybody else. According to a more recent survey, the percentage of Americans who strongly dislike the opposition party over the last two decades has gone up 400%. Now, while the stats are discouraging, and they should be discouraging, and we've all felt the weight of this, even if we didn't know the stats themselves, we felt the division, I think even more than it being discouraging, it's actually disastrous for us as followers of Jesus. Why? Because the fundamental attribution error makes it impossible to love people like Jesus loves people. As long as we're playing the game and being sucked into the gravitational pull of the fundamental attribution error, you will never be able to show up and love people as Jesus loves people. I think Ed Stetzer, he put it well. He said this. He said, you can't hate people and engage them with the gospel at the same time. 
You can't war with people and show the love of Jesus. You can't be both outraged and on mission. Like, like you, you just can't say, like, I hate you. Oh, can I tell you about the love of Jesus? Like, God loves you so much. While you completely oppose everything about them. See, mature, emotionally intelligent, curious, empathetic people don't fall for the fundamental attribution error. They must, and Jesus' followers must resist it because the mission of Jesus is at stake. The mission of Jesus is at stake. The very story we say we're a part of is at stake if we cannot get this right. Because you know what isn't impressive? Loving those who are easy to love. You want to know what's really impressive? Loving those that take, like, it's so hard to love them. It's so hard to show up for them. Loving people that oppose you and maybe stand for things that even feel like they threaten your being. You know, it's like how, how hard that is. And you know how we would rise above the noise of the world if we actually accomplished it. So how do we not get sucked into the fundamental attribution error and show up like Paul and Jesus did? How do we choose to say to all the yous that you know that I'm gonna choose you over the views that I hold? And I wanna give you a statement. And I hope this statement helps you next time you're tempted to be like, ugh, to go to war, to get back into fundamental attribution error mode. This statement is hard. This statement will check your ego. This statement, though I will say for myself, has not only saved me from having a lot of unnecessary fights, but it's also saved me from losing a lot of friendships unnecessarily. I wish I would have said this more in 2020. Here's the statement that I think will be hard, but will change your life if you do it. And the statement is this, they are probably not as wrong as I think, and I am probably not as right as I think. They are probably not as wrong as I think, and I am not as right as I think. If you're gonna choose you over a view, this is the sort of statement that we gotta ground ourselves on because you know what will for sure stop you from choosing you over a view? Is if you think to yourself, no, they are exactly as wrong as I think, and I am exactly as right as I think. That, that can destroy relationships and our witness as followers of Jesus. So let's dissect this. This is a hard message, y'all. This is a hard one. Let's dissect it. Here's the first one. They are probably not as wrong as I think. Justin Gibbon, a political strategist and founder of the AND campaign, he, he says this, I thought it was so powerful. He said, one ugly reality about hating your political opponents is that you start off hating their vices and end up hating their virtues as well. In your contempt, you begin to believe that everything about them is wrong, even their insights and practices that could improve you. I'm just gonna read that, that one line again. One ugly reality about hating your political opponents is that you start off hating their vices, but you end up hating their virtues as well. I think that's so good and sadly so true. When we throw out a person because of their view, you also throw out potentially their virtues as well. There's value present in every single human beings. And if there's any group of people on this earth that should believe and champion this message, shouldn't it be Christians? Shouldn't it be followers of Jesus who'd be first in line to say, everyone has good in them. Even that person, whoever that person you're thinking of right now, everyone has good in them. I mean, Finley, man, she corrected me on this the other day. Uh, we said something, I can't remember the context of it, but we, something along the lines, I said something like, you know, bad people go to jail. And she said, daddy, there is no bad people. Everyone's got kindness and good in them. There's just people who sometimes do bad things. And I was like, yeah, whatever, go to school. Like, <laughs> you know, right? Like, but she was right on. I mean, it's that whole faith like a child thing. Only Jesus talked about that. Um, there's value present in every single human being, even your political opponent. There's value in every single human being. And if, if, if we just lived that way and treated everybody like they had it, dignity and value and honored them, my goodness, we would be so noticeable, notable, and distinct in the world. I mean, we should believe this more than anyone. The entire story in the scripture starts, Genesis chapter one, verse 27. It says, God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Every single person. And in verse 31, it says, then God looked over all he had made and he saw that it was very, everyone say the last word with me, good. 
If you were born and raised in the church, chances are maybe you've heard of something called original human sin. And, and, and although my Bible has Genesis chapter three where humans commit sin and we rebel against God, and I'm not saying that sin doesn't exist or isn't real. I think that is fairly obvious that our world, there's something wrong. But, but I want you to know that the Bible doesn't start with original human sin. It starts with original human goodness. The first word that God says about humans is not sin. The first word God says to describe humans is good. It's good. They're made in my image. That is still true today. God never revoked that, never said, well, that was true then, but now it's different. No, there's good in all people. If anyone is to believe that there's good in every human being, it should be Christians. It is not noticeable, notable, or distinct to find the bad in people. That is the easiest thing to do to find bad things in people. But you know what would be noticeable, notable, and distinct? A community, community of people who are known for calling people to their highest identity and sort of canceling people because of their lowest moment. If anyone should get this, it should be Christians who claim their entire message is about a God who loved us, not because we got it all right, but who loves us even though we don't and who is with us and for us even though we don't. And what's beautiful about this way of living is that you position yourself. When you say there's good in everybody, there's value in everybody, even that person, even them, even them on the other side of the aisle, even them who voted for that candidate, or even them who stand for that policy, there's still good somewhere in them. There's still value. You know what happens when you do this? You position yourself to learn from everybody. You open your mind up and self up to learn from everyone. When you say, you know what? They're not as wrong as I think they are. I bet there's something I can get from them, something of value I can learn from them. When you decide to live this way, which is so rare, you will step out of the echo chambers that we all unintentionally or intentionally can find ourselves in and you open yourself up to learn from everyone. In fact, if I could push back, since this message is a little spicy anyways, I'll push back a little bit on cancel culture Now, let me just be clear. When I say what I'm about to say about cancel culture, what I'm not talking about is people speaking against injustice or calling out evil or brokenness or violence or abuse. We should call out those things and we should not tolerate that, right? So on that aspect of cancel culture, in fact, I would argue that's the origin of cancel culture was doing that. What it's become in a lot of ways looks a little bit more like this. I don't agree with you. You're dead to me. You messed up over, no redemption, no chance for renewal for you, which I could not think of a more non-Christian message when the very message of Christianity is what we're celebrating in three weeks, that Jesus rose again. And so if the church is championing a message of cancel culture and saying like, there's no redemption for anybody, no, that depth is too low. And I think we've missed the story of Jesus. But can I tell you one of my biggest grievances with cancel culture, the kind of hijacked unhealthy version of cancel culture? It's this, cancel culture lowers the IQ of the entire culture. Cancel culture lowers the IQ of the entire culture. It lowers our IQ because we're no longer willing to listen or learn from individuals or groups who do not see, interpret, or experience the world the same way that we do. So sometimes Democrats will get it right. Sometimes Republicans are gonna get it right. Sometimes independents are gonna get it right. Sometimes Democrats, Republicans, and independents are all gonna get it wrong. And sometimes it's gonna land somewhere there in the middle. But when we banish someone because of a vice, we in turn lose their virtues as well. Imagine how much of you we would lose if we banished you because of your lowest moment. There's so much good in each and every person in this room, regardless of your lowest moments, Church, I think it's time that we take Jesus' command to love others as he loved us seriously. Jesus says, love others as I have loved you. And he wasn't speaking to a room full of perfect people when he made that command. There's more to you than your view. And this is the second aspect of that statement. I am probably not as right as I think. They're probably not as wrong as I think. And you know what? I'm probably not as right as I think. And all my type A's, I feel you. All my, anyone here like a good debate? You're just like a debater. You'll debate with like a five-year-old on any, okay, nobody is just me. I'm just the person who needs therapy. Okay, so um, I, I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm here for it, but, but I have to say this part to myself. I'm probably not as right as I think. I'm probably not as right as I think. Here's what Eugene Cho again says. He says, our calling is not simply to change the world, but perhaps as important our calling is to be changed ourselves. 
And how can you ever be changed as long as you think you're 100% right? That you've got a monopoly on truth? No, no. So Peter, he invites us to take on a different posture. In 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter, he writes this to a group of Christians. He says, all of you, he says, dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Dress yourselves. I like that idea. It's like, Take off pride. You're gonna have to take off ego. You're gonna have to take off that need to always be right. You're gonna have to take. A, you're gonna. Have to, you're gonna have to put something better on. You know, we're gonna. We're gonna dress ourselves with humility. And James, the brother of Jesus, he would go on to James chapter one verse nineteen and say, "Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters." Again, he's talking to Christians. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. I mean, how many fights have we had because we did just the opposite? We were slow to listen, quick to speak, and really fast to get angry. And then we had a fight that didn't have to be. Human anger does not produce God's, the righteousness God desires. See, I love that this this picture James gives us here. He's like, you gotta be quick to listen and slow to speak. Why would anybody be quick to listen and slow to speak? The only reason is because you're trying to understand the person you're talking to. Paul is saying, hey, there might be things you don't know, things that you don't understand. So we're gonna be quick to listen. We're gonna be slow to speak and slow to get angry. I mean, you don't even need to be a Christian in this room to agree that's a better way to live. Like if we just did that, what James said, how much better would some of our dialogues be with people that we oppose or that oppose us? And so the implications of this is clear. In a world where everyone is trying to be heard, we are to be a people that are committed to hearing well. In a world committed to being seen, we are committed to seeing people. While culture has seemed to trade conversations for comments and traded questions for statements, we become noticeable, we become notable, and we become distinct when we refuse to play by those same rules and we exit the game entirely because we're about something bigger, better, and more beautiful. We become distinct when we choose to offer people dignity instead of defense. Organizational psychologist and New York Times bestseller, Adam Grant, uh, he's put it this way. He said, claiming the moral high ground is rarely a sign of virtue. It is often a signal of narcissism. People who consistently believe that they hold superior principles have inflated opinions of their own judgments. Being self-righteous is a barrier to respecting and learning from others. And then Paul, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, Paul in Ephesians in AD 60, he wrote this to a church in Ephesus. And he said, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united, everyone say united. He united Jews and Gentiles. And in that world of Paul, that's saying, there was really only two groups. You were a Jew, you were a Gentile. So let's just be like in our political system, Democrat, Republican, right? Like that's kind of where we're at. What Paul would be saying here is like, he's brought everyone together. He's united them into one people. When in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Because of Jesus, we can have and know peace with one another because God has, through Jesus, has removed the barrier that separates us. But hear me on this. Whenever we allow a view to stop us from loving any you around us, then you are rebuilding the wall that Jesus gave his life to destroy. When we say, nope, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose a view over you. I'm not going to love you as Jesus loved me. You are single-handedly putting the bricks back into the wall that Jesus died to tear down. In fact, I would say this. If you are preaching any message and calling it the message of Jesus, and that message is creating barriers instead of bridges, then I'm not so sure you're preaching the message of Jesus. I'm not sure you're actually teaching the message that Jesus invites us to live, one that brings people together, not tears people apart. And that brings me to one last thought. One last thought. I only gave you two thirds of the statement that I want you to say. The first is they're probably not as wrong as I think. The second is I'm not as right as I think. And that's hard enough as it is, but here's the third part. The third part, and this is important for us as followers of Jesus. They're not as wrong as I think, probably as wrong as I think. I'm not as right as I think. And third part is this, Jesus's mission is bigger than I think. They're probably not as wrong as I think. I'm probably not as right as I think, but you know what we need to remember? Jesus's mission is bigger than I think. Jesus's mission is bigger than I think. See, church, this 
this might offend someone. This might rub some people the wrong way. Um, you can email Lydia about it if you <laughs> don't like it. Um, Republicans are not God's gift to the world. Democrats are not God's gift to the world. America is not God's gift to the world. Jesus is God's gift to the world. I thought I'd get an amen from one Christian in the room on that one. (laughs) But I might just be the only one that believes it. So let me just try it again. Republicans are not God's gift to the world, and Democrats are not God's gift to the world, and America, my friend, is not God's gift to the world. Jesus is God's gift to the world. Christians in the room. So what if we lived like it? Right? Like, what if we had conversations like we believe that? Because I meet and see so many Christians that, honestly, I don't know if they think Jesus is God's gift to the world. It seems like they think their party is God's gift to the world. Their candidate is God's gift to the world. This country is God's gift to the world. Don't get me wrong. I love this country. But you know what? God's mission isn't just for this country. It's for the entire world. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that, what does it say next? Whoever, whoever. I almost think John put that in there just because he needed us to know. Whoever. So whoever, because we as people, we're gonna put people in boxes and categories on this side or that side, they're, they're with us or against us. And John is like, no, 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 Jesus here. He said, for God's love of the world, that God gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God's mission is people, all people, Republicans, Democrats, Uh, independents, conservatives, progressives, Americans, people from every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every person on this earth, rich, poor, gay, straight, doesn't matter where you land. You are God's priority. You are God's love. You are the reason Jesus came to this earth. God chose you not because you're perfect, not because you have it all together. God chose you over every shortcoming, over every screw up. God chose you over any view that you may have held. God chose you over everything. And so one of the most Christ-like things we can do is to try and do the same. Is to show up in a world no matter what your story is and whether I agree with it or not or like it or uncomfortable with it or not, no matter what your passion or platform is, to show up to the best of my abilities and say, I'm gonna choose you over a view. Because you know what? You're probably not as wrong as I think. And I'm probably not as right as I think. But one thing I do know is Jesus' mission is bigger than I think. It's for the entire world. The church used to be known for this. I want to be known for it again. How about you? Let's pray.